Hey guys, Sam from Amphis Makes. Happy Sunday. So welcome back to all my returners and hi to any newbies. If you are new here on a Saturday and a Sunday, I read you stories from this book here, which is Grimm's Complete Fairy Tales. And I have all the videos on this in a playlist on my channel. And I also read The Wizard of Oz, which has its own playlist as well. Plus there is lots of yarn and crochet content as well in their playlist. So go and have a look around and see if there is something for you. So I hope everyone is enjoying their Sunday. Remember this book was written a very, 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 very long time ago. And any hidden meanings, themes, morals, anything like that is that of the authors, which was the Grimm brothers. And it is not something that I am condoning. I am literally just reading you the words off the page. So... We start today on, bear with, bear with, uh, story 104, which is called Wise Folks. So I'm going to be looking down at the book and reading. So sit back, relax, have a nice cup of something to drink and your project to work on and just listen to the stories. So again, 104 Wise Folks. One day, a peasant took his good hazel stick out of the corner and said to his wife, Trina, I am going across country and shall not return for three days. If during that time the cattle dealer should happen to call and want to buy our three cows, you may strike a bargain at once, but not unless you can get two hundred thalers for them. Nothing less, do you hear? For heaven's sake, just go in peace, answered the woman. I will manage that. You indeed, said the man. You once fell on your head when you were a little child, and that affects you even now. But let me tell you this, if you do anything foolish, I will make your back black and blue, and not with paint, I assure you, but with the stick which I have in my hand, and the colouring shall last a whole year, you may rely on that. And having said that, the man went on his way. Next morning, the cattle dealer came, and the woman had no need to say many words to him. When he had seen the cows and heard the price, he said, I am quite willing to give that. Honestly speaking, they are worth it. I will take the beasts away with me at once. He unfastened their chains and drove them out of the barn, but just as he was going out of the door, the woman clutched him by the sleeve and said, You must give me the two hundred thalers now, or I cannot let the cows go. True, answered the man, but I have forgotten to buckle on my money belt. Have no fear, however, you shall have security for my paying. I will take two cows with me and leave one, and then you will have a good pledge. The woman saw the force of this and let the man go away with the cows and thought to herself, how pleased Hans will be when he finds how cleverly I have managed it. The peasant came home on the third day, as he said he would, and at once inquired if the cows were sold. Yes, indeed, dear Hans, answered the woman, and as you said, for two hundred thalers, they are scarcely worth so much, but the man took them without making any objection. Where is the money? asked the peasant. Oh, I have not got the money, replied the woman. He had happened to forget his money belt, but he will soon bring it, and he left good security behind him. What kind of security? asked the man. One of the three cows, which he shall not have until he has paid for the other two. I have managed very cunningly, for I have kept the smallest, which eats the least. The man was enraged and lifted up his stick and was just going to give her the beating he had promised her. Suddenly he let the stick fail and said, You are the stupidest goose that ever waddled on God's earth, but I am sorry for you. I will go out into the highways and wait for three days to see if I find anyone who is still stupider than you. If I succeed in doing so, you shall go scot-free, but if I do not find him, you shall receive your well-deserved reward without any discount. He went out into the great highways, sat down on a stone and waited for what would happen. Then he saw a peasant's wagon coming towards him and a woman was standing upright in the middle of it instead of sitting on the bundle of straw which was lying beside her or walking near the oxen and leading them. The man thought to himself, that is certainly one of the kind I am in search for of and jumped up and ran backwards and forwards in front of the wagon like one who is not very wise. What do you want, my friend, said the woman to him. I don't know you. Where do you come from? I have fallen down from heaven, replied the man, and don't know how to get back again. Couldn't you drive me up? No, said the woman, I don't know the way, but if you come from heaven, you can surely tell me how my husband, who has been there these three years, is. You must have seen him. Oh yes, I have seen him, but all men can't get on well. He keeps sheep, and the sheep give him a great deal to do. They run up the mountains and lose their way in the wilderness, and he has to run after them and drive them together again. His clothes are all torn to pieces too and will soon fall off his body. 
There is no tailor there, for St. Peter won't let any of them in, as you know, by the story. Who would have thought it, cried the woman. I tell you what, I will fetch his Sunday coat, which is still hanging at home in the cupboard. He can wear that and look respectable. You will be so kind as to take it with you. That won't do very well, answered the peasant. People are not allowed to take clothes into heaven. They are taken away from one at the gate. Then listen, said the woman. I sold my fine wheat yesterday and got a good lot of money for it. I will send that to him. If you hide the purse in your pocket, no one will know that you have it. If you can't manage it any other way, said the peasant, I will do you that favour. Just sit still where you are, said she, and I will drive home and fetch the purse. I shall soon be back again. I do not sit down on the bundle of straw, but stand up in the wagon, because it makes it lighter for the cattle. She drove her oxen away, and the peasant thought, That woman has a perfect talent for folly. If she really brings the money, my wife may think herself fortunate, for she will get no beating. It was not long before she came in a great hurry with the money, and with her own hands put it in his pocket. Before she went away, she thanked him again a thousand times for his courtesy. When the woman got home again, she found her son, who had come in from the field. She told him what unlooked-for things had befallen her, and then added, I am truly delighted at having found an opportunity of sending something to my poor husband. Who would ever have imagined that he could be suffering for want of anything up in heaven? The son was full of astonishment. Mother, said he, it is not every day that a man comes from heaven in this way. I will go out immediately and see if he is still to be found. He must tell me what it's like up there and how the work is done. He saddled the horse and rode off with all speed. He found the peasant who was sitting under a willow tree and was just going to count the money in the purse. Have you seen the man who has fallen down from heaven? cried the youth to him. Yes, answered the peasant. He has set out on his way back there and has gone up that hill from where it will be rather nearer. You could still catch him up if you were to ride fast. Alas, said the youth, I have been doing tiring work all day and the ride here has completely worn me out. You know the man. Be so kind as to get on my horse and go and persuade him to come here. Aha, thought the peasant. Here is another who has no wick in his lamp. But he said, why should I not do you this favour? And mounted the horse and rode off in a quick trot. The youth remained sitting there till night fell, but the peasant never came back. The man from heaven must certainly have been in a great hurry and would not turn back, thought he. And the peasant has no doubt given him the horse to take to my father. He went home and told his mother what had happened and that he had sent his father the horse so that he might not have to be always running about. You have done well, answered she. Your legs are younger than his and you can go on foot. When the peasant got home, he put the horse in the stable beside the cow which he had as a pledge and then went to his wife and said, Trina, as your luck would have it, I have found two who are still sillier fools than you. This time you escape without a beating. I will store it up for another occasion. Then he lighted his pipe, sat down in his grandfather's chair and said, It was a good stroke of business to get a sleek horse and a great purse full of money into the bargain for two lean cows. If stupidity always brought in as much as that, I would be quite willing to hold it in honour. So thought the peasant, but you no doubt prefer the simple folks. <clears throat> okay, story 105, which is stories about snake. The first story. There was once a little child whose mother gave her every afternoon a small bowl of milk and bread and the child seated herself in the yard with it. When she began to eat, however, a snake came creeping out of a crevice in the wall, dipped its little head in the dish and ate with her. The child had pleasure in this and when she was sitting there with her little dish and the snake did not come at once, she cried, Snake, snake, come qu swiftly. Here come, you tiny thing. You shall have your crumbs of bread. You shall refresh yourself with milk. Then the snake came in haste and enjoyed its food. Moreover, it showed gratitude, for it brought the child all kinds of pretty things from its hidden treasures, bright stones, pearls and golden playthings. The snake, however, only drank the milk and left the breadcrumbs alone. Then one day the child took its little spoon and struck the snake gently on its head with it and said, Eat the breadcrumbs as well, little thing. The mother, who was standing in the kitchen, heard the child talking to someone, and when she saw that she was striking a snake with her spoon, ran out with a log of wood and killed the good little creature. From that time forth, a change came over the child. As long as the snake had eaten with her, she had grown tall and strong, but now she lost her pretty rosy cheeks and wasted away. It was not long before the funeral bird began to cry in the night and the red breast to collect little branches and leaves for a funeral garland, and soon afterwards the child lay on her bier. Second story. 
An orphan child was sitting on the town wall spinning when she saw a snake coming out of a hole low down in the wall. Swiftly, she spread out before this one of the... Bl she spread out beside this one of the blue silk handkerchiefs which snakes have such a strong liking for and which are the only things they will creep on. As soon as the snake saw it, it went back, then returned, bringing with it a small golden crown, laid it on the handkerchief and then went away again. The girl took up the crown. It glittered and was of delicate golden filigree work. It was not long before the snake came back for the second time, but when it no longer saw the crown, it crept up to the wall and in its grief smote its little head against it as long as it had strength to do so, until at last it lay there dead. If the girl had but left the crown where it was, the snake would certainly have brought still more of its treasures out of the hole. Third story. A snake cries, hoo hoo, hoo hoo. A child says, come out. The snake comes out, then the child inquires about her little sister. Have you not seen little red stockings? The snake says, no, neither have I. Then I am like you. Hoo hoo, hoo hoo, hoo hoo. Very bizarre stories, guys. Like I said, I'm just reading the stories from the book. Okay, so last story for today is story 106, and that is The Poor Miller's Boy and the Cat. In a certain mill lived an old miller who had neither wife nor child, and three apprentices, apprentices served under him. As they had been with him several years, he one day said to them, I am old and want to sit in the chimney corner, go out, and whoever brings me the best horse home to, to him I will give the mill, and in return for it he shall take care of me till my death. The third of the boys was, however, the drudge, who was looked on as foolish by the others. They could not imagine what he would do with a mill, and in any case he would not have it. All three went out together, and when they came to the village the two said to stupid hands, you may just as well stay here as long as you live, you will never get a horse. Hans, however, went with them, and when it was night they came to a cave in which they lay down to sleep. The two sharp ones waited until Hans had fallen asleep, then they got up and went away, leaving him where he was. And they thought that they had done a very clever thing, but it was certain to turn out ill for them. When the sun arose and Hans woke up, he was lying in a deep cavern, he looked around on every side and exclaimed, Oh heavens, where am I? Then he got up and clambered out of the cave, went into the forest and thought, Here I am, quite alone and deserted. How shall I obtain a horse now? While he was thus walking, full of thought, he met a small tabby cat which said quite kindly, Hans, where are you going? Alas, you cannot help me. I well know your desire, said the cat. You wish to have a beautiful horse. Come with me and be my faithful servant for seven years long and then I will give you one more beautiful than any you have seen in your whole life. Apologies for Mike snoring in the background if you can hear him. He's not very well. Well, this is a wonderful cat, thought Hans, but I am determined to see if she is telling the truth. So she took him with her into her enchanted castle where there was nothing but cats who were her servants. They leapt nimbly upstairs and downstairs and were merry and happy. In the evening, where they sat down to dinner, three of them had to make music. One played the bassoon, the other the fiddle, and the third put the trumpet to his lips and blew out his cheeks as much as he possibly could. When they had dined, the table was carried away, and the cat said, Now Hans, come and dance with me. No, said he, I won't dance with a pussycat. I have never done that yet. Then take him to bed, said she to the cats. So one of them lighted his way to his bedroom, one pulled his shoes off, one his stockings, and at last one of them blew out the candle. Next morning they returned and helped him out of bed, one put his stockings on for him, one tied his garters, one bought his shoes, one washed him, and one dried his face with her tail. That feels very soft, said Hans. He, however, had to serve the cat and chop some wood every day, and to do that he had an axe of silver, and the wedge and saw were of silver, and the mallet of copper. So he chopped the wood small, stayed there in the house and had good meat and drink, but never saw anyone but the tabby cat and her servants. One day she said to him, Go and mow my meadow and dry the grass, and gave him a scythe of silver and a whetstone of gold, but bade him deliver them up again carefully. So Hans went there and did what he was bidden, and when he had finished the work, he carried the scythe, whetstone and hay to the house, and asked if it was not yet time for her to give him his reward. 
No, said the cat, you must first do something more for me of the same kind. There is timber of silver, carpenter's axe, square, and everything that is needful, all of silver, with these build me a small house. Then Hans built the small house and said that he had now done everything, and still he had no horse. Nevertheless, the seven years had gone by with him as if they were six months. The cat asked him if he would like to see her horses. Yes, said Hans. Then she opened the door of the small house, and when she had opened it, there stood twelve horses, such horses so bright and shining that his heart rejoiced at the sight of them. And now she gave him food and drink and said, Go home, I will not give you your horse away with you, but in three days' time I will follow you and bring it. So Hans set out, and she showed him the way to the mill. She had, however, never once given him a new coat, and he had been obliged to keep on his dirty old smock frock, which he had brought with him, and which during the seven years had everywhere become too small for him. When he reached home, the two other apprentices were there again as well, and each of them certainly had brought a horse with him, but one of them was a blind one and the other lame. They asked Hans where his horse was. It will follow me in three days' time. Then they laughed and said, Indeed, stupid Hans, where will you get a horse? It will be a fine one. Hans went into the parlour, but the miller said he should not sit down to table, for he was so ragged and torn that they would all be ashamed of him if anyone came in. So they gave him a mouthful of food outside, and at night when they went to rest, the two others would not let him have a bed, and at last he was forced to creep into the goose house and lie down on a little hard straw. In the morning, when he awoke, the three days had passed, and a coach came with six horses, and they shone so bright that it was delightful to see them and a servant brought a seventh as well, which was for the poor miller's boy. And a magnificent princess alighted from the coach and went into the mill, and this princess was the little tabby cat whom poor Hans had served for seven years. She asked the miller where the miller's boy and drudge was. Then the miller said, We cannot have him here in the mill, for he is so ragged he is lying in the goose house. Then the king's daughter said that they were to bring him immediately. So they brought him out, and he had to hold his little smock frock together to cover himself. The servants unpacked splendid garments and washed him and dressed him, and when that was done, no king could have looked more handsome. Then the maiden desired to see the horses which the other apprentices had brought home with them, and one of them was blind and the other lame. So she ordered the servant to bring the seventh horse, and when the miller saw it, he said that such a horse as that had never yet entered his yard. And that is for the miller's third boy, said she. Then he must have the mill, said the miller, but the king's daughter said that the horse was there and that he was to keep his mill as well and took her faithful hands and set him in the coach and drove away with him. They first drove to the little house which he had built with the silver tools and behold it was a great castle and everything inside it was of silver and gold and then she married him and he was rich, so rich that he had enough for all the rest of his life. After this, let no one ever say that anyone who is silly can never become a person of importance. So guys, we are going to leave it there for today. There will be more stories next Saturday and Sunday, all being well. We have Magazine Monday coming up tomorrow. We have my Hobie Bingo winnings on Tuesday. On Wednesday, we have some happy mail I received all the way from Australia. Thursday will be Tile of the Week Thursday. And Friday, we will round it up again with some more crochet catch-up. So... I hope the rest of your Sunday goes very, very well and that you have had some lovely crafting time this weekend. I hope you are all doing well yourselves and I hope that you are all safe. I will see you tomorrow for Magazine Monday. Until then, enjoy what's left of your Sunday and I will see you very, very soon. Stay safe, be kind, look after one another, get some good quality time in with your loved ones and get some good quality crafting time in. I will see you in the next one or around the YouTube streets. Bye guys, love you.